wanted to take a minute to introduce myself. I am Pastor Nick Dalio, the lead pastor here at Proving Ground Church. I want to thank you for stopping by our channel and enjoying today's sermon. If this ministry has been a blessing to you, whether it's your first time watching or maybe you've been watching this church from afar for several years now, either way, I'd like to offer you the opportunity to partner with us. There are many different ways you can partner with us from afar. In the description of this video, you will see several links. Some of them will take you to our app. Some of them will take you to a page where you can uh, partner with us through there. You can also send a check through the mail. Our address is 1 Proving Ground Road in Lakehurst, New Jersey. The zip is 087. We couldn't do any of this ministry without your financial support. So I thank you in advance for partnering with us. Enjoy today's sermon. Good morning. I'm Ron Freison, at least that's what they told me. I'm one of the elders here at Proven Ground Church, and I'd like to thank Pastor Nick uh, once again for giving me the opportunity to teach the Word of God again today. It's always an honor, and I truly appreciate it. Um, this morning, we will continue our series, Love Letters, and we'll be looking at what the Bible has to say about the topic of love. To prepare for this message, I looked up the definition of the word love, and the consensus definition among a variety of dictionaries was basically this, a deep or strong feeling of affection. That's true, but it's not thorough enough. Defining love has been an elusive task at best. It's the most talked about subject, and the topic has been approached from every conceivable angle by artists, writers, poets, and philosophers, and even preachers throughout the ages. Even in modern times, love is the topic we spend the most time analyzing. Uh, romance novels are by far the biggest genre of books sold. Romantic movies have been in the top 10 genres of movies for decades. The biggest one I remember when I was a kid was simply titled Love Story. And they tried to define love with the simple phrase, love means never having to say you're sorry. <laughs> a nice sentiment, but not completely true. There were many television shows about love. There was Love Connection. Do you remember Love American Style? Do, who could forget the love boat? And of course, the greatest of all time, I Love Lucy. My thing is music, so I want to take a minute and just uh, highlight how the music industry has approached the topic of love. And just so you know my heart, I'm not trying to glorify the singers or the songs. I'm just trying to point how, at how apart from God, man cannot properly describe love sufficiently. So I'm going to go a little fast, so try to keep up. First, Frank Sinatra taught us that love was spelled L-O-V-E. Then he sang about love and marriage. Elvis said, I can't help falling in love with you. And he had a burning love. The Beatles loved to sing about love. They had songs like Love Me Do, And I Love Her, Can't Buy Me Love, P.S. I Love You, It's Only Love, She Loves You, Yeah, 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 <laughs> and All You Need Is Love. Jackie DeShannon sang a song that is still applicable today. What the world needs now is love. Many people will agree that love is all you need, but no one seems to be in agreement about what exactly this thing called love is. Songs have many questions about love. Questions like, will you love me tomorrow? Where did our love go? And do you love me now that I can dance? <laughs> you need to know how deep is your love so you don't drown in a sea of love. You can go to the chapel of love or get on the love train and go to the love shack. You can get lost in love, be looking for love in all the wrong places. <laughs> Dean Martin taught us how to say love in Italian with that's amore. Bobby Vinton taught us that in Polish, moja droga ja cię kocha means I love you so. And I don't know what language this is, but the Delphonics taught us that la 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 <laughs> means I love you. <laughs> Many songs have titles about love that contradict each other. One song says, I'm... Um, there's endless love. The next song says, no, I'm all out of love. One song says, love will keep us together. The next one says, only love can break your heart. One song says, love is a many splendored thing. Another says, nah, love is strange. 
One says, love can make you happy. Another one says, love hurts. One says, I can't get enough of your love. The next one says, don't tell me you love me. <laughs> one says, love is a beautiful thing. And the other one says, love stinks. Okay. You can drink love potion number nine and end up with a love hangover. <laughs> you can tell someone, I think I love you, then ask, is this love? You can have words of love, a whole lot of love, a power of love, baby love, a groovy kind of love, puppy love, big love, or a crazy little thing called love. Some singers tell you what to do with love. They say, hey, find me somebody to love. Put a little love in your heart. Stop in the name of love. Come and get your love. You can't hurry love, and hey, you've got to hide your love away. In the end, the singer Hathaway asked the question we all want the answer to, what is love? Then adds, baby, don't hurt me, because he realizes there must be a downside to love as well as the good. All of these books and TVs and movies and songs, but no sufficient definition for love. So where can we find the best, definitive, comprehensive, correct definition of love? Is there some reliable source of information we can trust to give us the truth. Never fear, because in 1957, the singing group The Monotones asked the profound question, who wrote the book of love? <laughs> so there are two things in that question, in that question that we can say in that song title that will help us today. Number one is we know that there is a book of love, and number two, we know who wrote that book, okay? So now, as we leave behind the flawed and inadequate definitions of man, we now turn to the real book of love, the Bible, to see what the author of love, God Almighty, has to say about the topic. Our text will be 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which is known as the love chapter. The title of my sermon is Love from Above. Please pray with me. Father, we do thank you for this day. Uh, I thank you for all of those who have been praying for me and my family, for my wife to be here today, and I appreciate that those prayers, Lord God, we lift up everyone else who cannot be here today for any reason, that you would just meet them and that you would just continue to bless them, Father. Help us, our hearts to be still now and help us to receive what your word has to say. Speak to us by your spirit and through your word and let Jesus be exalted. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, as we begin, I'd like to welcome our online family and my mother, who I didn't tell I was preaching today because I wanted to surprise her. So hi, Mom. <laughs> okay. Um, we're going to start in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and in verse 1. By way of background, the book of 1 Corinthians was written by the Apostle Paul to the church in the Greek city of Corinth. It was an affluent city and was associated with false religious idolatry. The temples of the Greek gods, Apollo and Aphrodite, were located there, and their followers mixed religion with sexual sin, and their temples housed prostitutes for perverted religious rituals. As people became part of the church in Corinth, they still had a lot of carnalities that they brought with them. A big problem was the abuse of spiritual gifts, such as speaking in tongues, prophecy, and words of knowledge. Paul saw that the people were not using the gifts to edify the church as God had intended, but rather they were misusing the gifts to promote themselves and to pridefully look down on their brothers and sisters in Christ. What was the root of the problem? A lack of love in their hearts. So Paul wrote this chapter to address the topic of love as the remedy for the situation. And of course, it still applies to the church today. And just a quick note or a word to the young people and single people in the room, please do not tune out because you don't think this topic pertains to you. Believe me, one day it will. Most likely when you least are paying attention, you'll be in Wawa reaching for a bag of junk food and your eyes will meet. And five years from now, you'll be sitting in the fifth row here at PGC, and you'll have a set of triplets in the nursery. <laughs> so pay attention. We begin in verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Paul is not chastising the Corinthians for using spiritual gifts. His emphasis is on using the gifts without having love for the church as their motivation. The Corinthians were speaking in tongues, not to edify the church or glorify God, 
but rather to draw attention to themselves and to elevate their status in the church as being more spiritual than everyone else around them. So Paul says they sound like brass or clanging cymbals. I'm a drummer. My son was the one playing. Jesse was playing the drums before. And I just happen to love the sound of a clanging cymbal in its proper context. When the full band is playing and the cymbals are hit at the right time, then they enhance the music with the other instruments playing with you. But if I were just to walk over there now and start hitting the cymbals as hard as I could without any other instruments accompanying me, you would all leave the room. In the same way, using a spiritual gift to promote yourself without love is like a clanging cymbal without a band. Today we would say it's like nails on the chalkboard. Even our regular speech, apart from the gift of tongues, needs to be guided by love. Does it matter to you if what someone's saying is true if they don't say it in love? For instance, I could say, you really need to apply yourself and work hard if you want to succeed. Or, you need to stop being so lazy and get moving if you want to make it in life. Is your motivation to build up in love or to tear down? Words are like knives. In the hands of a surgeon, they can heal. In the hands of a criminal, they are deadly weapons. When you speak, do people hear a nice melody or just a clanging cymbal? Love makes all the difference. Verse 2, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Once again, the gifts are not the issue. I'm operating in the gift of prophecy right now, not the foretelling of what's going to happen in the future, but rather the foretelling or the teaching or the proclaiming of the word of God to edify the church. If a pastor or teacher loves the church, they need to pray, they need to study, they need to research and to diligently search the scriptures and totally rely on the power of the Holy Spirit to give them a message that will build up and bless the people of God. Without the Holy Spirit and without love, what I'm saying would cease to be a sermon and would just be a speech that any performer or politician could give. You may know a lot about a certain topic, and you may talk a lot to people about that topic, but if you're talking just to hear yourself talk and to show off your knowledge, then you're not doing it with love because you don't care about the people that you're talking to. And you know the old saying is true. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. All your facts and figures may be correct, but are you speaking the truth in love? Verse 3, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. Here Paul is talking about sacrificial giving, both of treasures and of oneself. In the days of the early church, many Corinthians who converted from paganism to become followers of Jesus often lost their jobs, their homes, their possessions, and so they had to rely on the generosity of others in the church to supply their needs. Many gave the ultimate sacrifice of being martyred for their faith through beheading, stoning, crucifixion, being fed to wild animals in the Colosseum, and being burned alive, as that verse says. We have many Christians around the world today being martyred for their faith. But here in America, we haven't had to make the ultimate sacrifice yet. So how does this apply to us? Maybe you sacrifice long hours and years of your life in an unfulfilling job to put food on the table. Maybe you cook the food that's on the table, and year after year, without so much as a thank you from those who gobble it down and disappear as quickly as they came, shopping, cleaning, doing the laundry, unnoticed, and taken for granted fixing things around the house, working overtime, and missing out on simple pleasures so you can provide for your family, but nobody cares. The Greek word for love that Paul uses in this verse is the word agape. It means an unconditional, sacrificial love, a love that doesn't look for credit, notoriety, or reward. The ideal relationship or marriage is when both people are striving to love one another sacrificially. Unfortunately, in most cases, um, each person thinks that they, of course, are the only one who's sacrificially loving, and of course the problem is their spouse. 
When you think highly of yourself and lowly of your spouse, then you are not truly loving sacrificially. You serve in the church, but don't feel you've been recognized? Learn to serve with sacrificial love. You give or work or provide for others without a simple thank you? Give of your treasures and of yourself sacrificially. When people don't acknowledge you, God does if what you're doing is done in love. When you love sacrificially, you are most like Jesus because it was the same sacrificial love that enabled Jesus to hang on the cross for us all. Verse 4, love is patient, love is kind. Let me ask you a question. How patient are you? This verse says that love is patient and kind. The two seem to go together. You can't be kind without being patient. We've all experienced waiters at a restaurant when they seem to be in a rush and they're impatient because we're trying to take our time to decide what we want to order. Or you sit forever in a waiting room and then the doctor rushes through your visit in five minutes. Or you're on the phone for 45 minutes on hold and then you get rushed off by a customer service representative. And how many times here in the wonderful state of New Jersey have you encountered people who are violating every traffic law in the book endangering you and everyone else on the road because they were impatient. In any of those scenarios, would you say those impatient people were kind? Patience and kindness go together. On a more personal level, how do you feel when someone is rushing you to speak because they are an impatient listener? The invention of the cell phone and all the 30 second or less videos that we consume and the sound bites have severely hindered the practice of patiently and intently listening and being able to engage in meaningful conversations of any substance. What about helping little old ladies across the street? You can't grab granny by the wrist and run her across four lanes of traffic. That would not be kind. Um, my wife Lynn works with autistic children. She has to have a tremendous amount of patience with them and she's constantly showing them kindness in tangible ways that shows how much she loves them. Patience and kindness are vital aspects of showing love to those around you. Okay, so we've just looked at a few positive attributes of love. Now we'll encounter eight consecutive descriptions of what love is not and what it does not do. Why? Because we have a tendency to define love on our own terms and overlook the negative aspects of our own behavior. So God has to clarify a few items for us. So continuing on, it says, it does not envy. When you love someone, you shouldn't be envious of their position or achievements. If you have a brother or sister that's more athletic or more advanced academically, you should support them and share in their successes. If your spouse attains a level of success at work or is active in the church or community, you should see his or her success as an extension of your own because you're one flesh, according to the word of God. As long as their aspirations aren't detrimental to the well-being of the family because they become excessive and all-consuming, then you should be supportive, not envious. Next, it does not boast. It is not proud. Sometimes the pride and the boasting rear their ugly heads because the one doing the bragging feels the need to validate themselves due to a lack of validation from their loved ones. For instance, a father who has, brought, has to broadcast the hard day that he had at work and his terrible commute home is sometimes looking for someone to say, we appreciate how hard you work and sacrifice for our family. A mother who goes down the list of things she does around the house does so because it's been too long since any appreciation for her endless efforts to keep the house clean and make a nice dinner for the family have been expressed to her by anyone else in the household. Young people, if you want to see your mother speechless or you want to melt her heart like butter, try saying thank you at the dinner table or just because she did the laundry. Once the paramedics resuscitate her, <laughs> she will be blessed beyond measure, believe me. When someone has been deprived of appreciation, your silence can break their spirit. Your thank you can break that silence. Verse 5, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. Here is the unholy tandem of pulling someone else down 
in order to build yourself up. Both are the opposite of love. Let me try to illustrate what this looks like. So this podium here represents um, your relationships. It could be somebody that you're dating. It could be your, somebody you're engaged to, your fiance, your spouse, your children, your, your parents, your relatives, okay? Or just friends, okay? So you have this podium here. Keeping the podium in front of you represents putting others first, supporting others, promoting others, okay? From this vantage point, as you look towards your future and you have aspirations to have fulfillment in your own life, they're always in your line of sight. So the decisions you make about what you want to accomplish and what you want to achieve and what you want to have always takes into consideration their feelings and their dreams because they're always here before you. This is putting love other people first. This is being sacrificial in your loving. Consequently, when you put yourself first, you have a chance to leave those behind. You lose sight of them because they're behind you, and you're only focused on what you want and what you desire and what you're trying to achieve. And I'm not talking about in an abusive situation. In an abusive situation, sometimes you do have to cut that off if you're talking about physical safety. You do need to put others behind sometimes. But in the healthy relationship, when you put the others behind you and you put your own interest before them and you become self-centered and self-seeking, sometimes you desire just to walk completely away from them because you don't take into account how your decisions are going to impact the relationship. Being self-seeking and putting yourself first is the key that unlocks the door to things like adultery, divorce, young people walking away from the godly principles that they were raised with and rebelling against their parents and broken lives. True love puts others first. Next, it is not easily angered. Notice it doesn't say is never angered because that would be impossible. Um, Ephesians 4.26 says, be angry but do not sin, which allows for the emotion of anger without crossing the life crossing the line into sinful behavior such as violence or hatred or cruelty. The key is being angry about the situation or the circumstances without directing your anger at the person. When you are easily angered, touchy, hot-tempered, hypersensitive, you have a tendency to take everything to heart and to lash out at others in an attempt to win a battle when no one else is actually fighting against you. This is not love. Next, it keeps no records of wrongs. Now, here we go. We've all heard of the honey-do list. This is the honey-don't list. This is the list that gets pulled out during arguments. You remind your loved one or spouse of something that they did or said that hurt you in the past, and you use it as a weapon to paint your loved one into a corner so that you can declare checkmate in the heat of the battle. It may be words that were said that hurt you. It may be a decision that cost you something that you valued. It may be a guy or a girl's name that you pull out like a trump card and you open up an old wound so you can claim victory in the argument. It can be something that was said 10 minutes ago or something that was done 10 years ago. Unforgiveness has a memory like an elephant. True love has selective amnesia. Unforgiveness is constantly looking for a pen and paper to write down the wrongs that others have done for you. True love is looks for the garbage can to throw that list away. We are most like Jesus when we choose to forgive others. Verse 6, it does not rejoice in iniquity. This is the idea of not rejoicing or finding pleasure in the shortcomings or the downfalls of others caught in sinful behavior. Being glad that somebody got what they had coming to them, rather than having pity for how sin is destroying a life that Jesus died for. It's enjoying gossip or entertaining rumors about someone you dislike, hoping it's all true because you've appointed yourself as judge, jury, and executioner for that person. Remember Jesus said, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged yourself. So now we begin to turn the corner back to the positive aspects of love. But it rejoices in the truth. Philippians 4.8 says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, 
whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. If you can apply this verse to how you think about your loved ones or spouse, you can cultivate a deep, meaningful, and fulfilling love within your relationships. Learn to rejoice in the good things that God has truly blessed you with in the relationships he's allowed you to be in. So now we'll move on to the four alls, A-L-L-S, of love. These are the positive characteristics that make love strong. Verse 7, love bears all things. The Greek word for bears is stego, okay, which means to protect or keep by covering. I think of being protected in battle by a shield, okay? Life throws a lot of things at you, and many times you find yourself in need of a shield. And I'm speaking from experience. Try being a black man marrying a Jewish woman in 1988. <laughs> On our wedding day, my wife told the guest, if I have to go through any tough times, I want to go through it with this guy. And she meant what she said because 36 years later, we're still standing side by side. But we didn't do it in our own strength. Psalm 28.7 says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. Next, love believes all things. This is having the mindset that you will look for, hold on to, and treasure the best about each other. Not allowing bad thoughts or hard feelings to take root in your relationships, but to allow love to have the preeminence in your home. The way to believe the best about each other is to have everyone in your home believe the truth about Jesus. In John 14, 1, Jesus says, you believe in God, also believe in me. When your family and other relationships are based on the foundation of belief in Jesus, then love will flourish and grow. Next, love hopes all things. It's only October, and some stores are already shoving Christmas down our throats. When you're a child, Christmas can never come too soon because you are hoping to find certain things under the tree. Every new year, we look forward to the new year and hope that it would be better than the last. Hope is important, especially when you throw love into the mix because love can be messy at times. Love can be a minefield of emotions and obstacles and detours. But if you have hope, If you can fix your eyes on the stars, if you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, then you can continue to move forward. Children hope that their parents stop fighting and that their father comes back home someday. Parents hope that their child will talk with them again or overcome their addictions. Spouses hope that their love can be rekindled. Many hold out hope for loved ones to have a relationship with Jesus. If love is the engine, hope is the gasoline. Finally, love endures all things. To endure is to not buckle under the weight of whatever it is you're carrying. Love involves addition. You start off alone, then one becomes two. When you become two, you increase the weight you may have to endure. When two becomes three or four or more, the weight increases, the problems increase, the stresses increase, the bills increase. But in God's perfect planning, the strength also increases, the ability to endure increases because the love increases. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says, though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a three-stranded cord is not easily broken. So when you have true love, you have strength in numbers, you plus your spouse, you plus your family. But the greatest equation is you plus your spouse or family plus Jesus Christ, because the old saying is true, you plus Jesus is a majority, and together your love will endure all things. Verse 8, love never fails. The Greek word for fail means to fall from position or to become powerless or to perish. Some translations use the words love never ends. It never becomes out of fashion or style or loses its potency. It's always there. Love never fails, but we fail to love sometimes. In 1 John 4, 8, 
it says God is love. Part of the essence of the eternal God is his love. And since God is eternal, love, which originates from and finds its fullest expression in God, is also eternal. Love never ends. Continuing in verse 8, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. We finish here where we started, talking about the spiritual gifts. Here Paul concludes that while love is eternal, the gifts of the prophecy and tongues and knowledge are not eternal. They serve a specific purpose for a specific time, which is the church age. While the church is here on earth, spiritual gifts serve that as tools to edify the church and point people to Jesus for his glory. They're only part of the picture. Verses 9 and 10. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. In verse 10, Paul states that when we have the full, complete person of Jesus Christ standing before our eyes in heaven, then the church will no longer have need for anything to point us to Jesus. One of my favorite bands is the Christian band Newsboys. Um, I have t-shirts, CDs, concert DVDs, music videos, and playlists of their music over the years. All of these have enabled me to enjoy the band. However, one year our son Jesse got our family backstage meet and greet passes to meet the band and hang out them in, with, with them in private before the concert, okay? I didn't bring my t-shirts and DVDs and music videos or playlists to remind me of the band. Why not? Because I was standing there face to face with the band themselves. I could talk and joke and ask questions and tell them how much I've appreciated their music and their ministry over the years. When the church age is over and we enter eternity in heaven, we will no longer have the need for spiritual gifts or even preaching. No more Bible studies or VBS or seminars or retreats or Sunday sermons. When you're face to face with Jesus, you'll be saying, Ron who? Nick who? You won't even have to worry about us speaking anymore. Verse 11, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Just as a grown man no longer plays with wooden blocks or Hot Wheels cars or crayons, when the bride of Christ, the church, is finally complete and stands in the presence of Jesus for all eternity, we will have no need for road signs to point the way home anymore. Verse 12, for now we see in the mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. Everything we have here and now gives us a glimpse of Jesus, a taste of what's yet to come. But in the same way that a preview is not the whole movie and an appetizer is not the whole meal, all we know and learn and experience now is a foreshadow of the glory to come. Like someone looking at an eye chart in a doctor's office, they can see the letters, but they're not exactly all clear. But the time is coming when we will no longer have to look in a dim mirror, because when God finally wraps up this period of time and we enter eternity, we will be done with all the stresses and all the heartaches and all the worries of this world. And like the song says, soon and very soon, we are going to see the king face to face and in living color. <laughs> Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. One day, we will no longer have to hope for the eternal kingdom of God. One day, we will not need evidence because the unseen will become visible and tangible. We will stand in the presence of the perfect love of God forever. And our final verse, verse 13. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest is love. One day, we will no longer have to walk by faith because we will walk on streets of gold side by side with Jesus. One day we won't have to hope for an end of pain and suffering because every tear will be wiped from our eyes by our Savior. But for all eternity, we will continue to love Jesus. 
we will serve and worship and praise him with a perfect and holy love that we can't even imagine here on earth. And the best part is we don't have to wait to get to heaven. We can start today when we sing, when we give, when we serve, when we love one another, we are sharing a gift of love with our king. There was a song in the 1970s that asked the question, now that we found love, what are we going to do with it? To find Jesus is to find love. Jesus was love in human skin. If you're finding the love of Jesus today for the first time, you need to receive his love and his grace and his mercy. Jesus has the only love that can truly fill your heart and satisfy your soul. If you've already found the love of Jesus, then you need to nurture it. Spend time in the word and prayer and fellowship with God and his people. And lastly, you need to share the love of Jesus with others, family, friends, coworkers, classmates, and whoever God brings your way each day. What the world needs now is love, but not the mushy, shallow love of Hollywood movies or the empty, meaningless love of romance novels and rock songs. Jesus loved you enough to die on the cross and pay the penalty for your sins. Do you love the people of this world enough to tell them about this great love from above that you have found? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that the word says that we can love because you first loved us. We thank you that you sent your son because you so loved the world. Father, we ask that you would just help us to treasure that love, to hide that love in our heart and to share it with those around us, Father. Help us to be peacemakers. Help us to be your ambassadors of love even today. And for those who are just finding out about that love, we pray that you would just capture their hearts and introduce them to our Savior who loved us more than anyone else and gave his life. So we thank you, Father. We give you all praise and glory and honor in Jesus' name.